Hello, folks. Thanks for being here and welcome to another fantastic episode of RFRX. My name is Eric Wells, and I am so glad that you're here today. I am the online programming director for Recovering from Religion. And with me as my co-host today is Dr. Kara Griffin. Kara, welcome. So Thank good to you. see you again. Glad to be here and see all these yeah. fine people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at the beginning of every single RFRX, we have a poll. And today is absolutely no different. Today, we have four questions. And these questions are kind of designed to get you thinking about what we're going to be talking about today. So the very first question is, have you ever been told you're a sex addict? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Question number two, were you taught that porn use would ruin your marriage? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Question number three, you are clearly a sex addict if you either have two sex partners in your life, 10 sex partner, partners in your life, 50 sex partners in your life, 100, or none of the above. And question number four, this is a true or false question. Religious people have fewer affairs and use porn less than non-religious people. All right, so that poll will be going during this whole introduction part. And once we begin to introduce our guest, I will uh, go ahead and close it down. Uh, so uh, this is RFRX. Kara, why don't you tell us why we're here, what this show is all about? I would love to. So RFRX is the best thing to do on a Monday evening. It's a weekly online program where we have guests come on to discuss topics that might be relevant to folks in RFR. And it's all sorts of topics. We go from people discussing um, particular experiences in a religious community that they grew up in, to people talking about books, to talking about tips and tricks for dealing with, you know, family members, mental health issues, all sorts of topics, whatever they might be. Um, and I'm super excited about the one we have today, which the poll probably gave a clue about. And um, so all sorts of stuff. And of course, this is not a replacement for our online community or our support group. It's a complement to those communities where we get some advice, coping skills, and learn all sorts of interesting things from our guests. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, inquiries, death threats, we're taking those two now, you can send those to us over email at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And I think Eric's dropping that in the chat. And all of the previous recordings of RFRX, of which there are about, I don't know, ooh, what do we have? Uh, we have got uh, well over, yeah, we've got well over yeah. 90 up on YouTube and there's several more in the in the queue waiting to be edited but we've got yeah. all over like 110 episodes we've done yeah they're all up there they're they're on our youtube channel and eric's dropping that link in the chat as well so go check those out if you want to see more and then uh eric do you want to tell us what rfr is <laughs> You bet. So folks, we've been slinging around this initialism RFR, and you may be wondering if this is your first time here, you may be wondering, what the heck does that stand for? And of course, it stands for recovering from religion. And RFR, we here at RFR, we have a mission, and our mission is to offer hope, healing, and support to those who are struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. And we have designed so many cool programs around that mission in pursuit of that mission. And uh, we're going to kind of describe a few of them as we go forward. So um, tell us, Kara, how do we offer hope, healing, and support, kind of starting with the healing part? Yeah, absolutely. So healing is what we offer primarily through our helpline. And that is something you can access either online through the chat function on our website, or you can physically call on the phone, either one. Um, and that is available 24-7. Um, just go to our website, recoveringfromreligion.org, and you can either hit the button to chat in on your computer, or you can call and you will be connected with a helpline agent who has been trained to listen empathetically to what's going on. They're not going to be judging or criticizing or anything like that. They're going to just listen to, to what your story is, what your situation is, and try and point you in the direction of some resources and things like that, which you can also access if you want to go directly to those resources. We have a resources page that Eric's dropping in the chat as well. Um, so you can access those yourself 
too. Um, so that's healing. Um, the next thing that we offer is hope, or at least we try to. Um, and we do that primarily with our blog and our podcast. And the idea behind that is just that we're able to use those spaces to share and listen to other people's personal stories and kind of get that feeling of, you know, hey, we're all in this together. And, you know, some people may have experienced something that really resonates with you or gives you some inspiration, like, hey, they got through that. Hey, okay, that, you know, maybe I'm going to be okay too, that kind of thing. And so all sorts of experiences and stories are on there. So uh, Eric is also dropping those links in the chat. So feel free to check those out if you'd like to get some of that experience. And then next, Eric, do you want to talk about how we offer support? Absolutely. Folks, I love talking about this part of our uh, recovering from religion, the peer support groups. This is where I cut my teeth. This is how I was introduced to recovering from religion. And I have just been um, totally changed for the better because of it. So uh, the support groups, man, if you are kind of struggling with stuff like you're transitioning out of religion, or if you're still kind of in, but you've got some doubts, or even if it's been like years and years, but you're still struggling with some issues that pop up, the support groups is exactly what you could probably use. Um, this is where we all get to meet together, uh, whether it's at a, um, uh, on Zoom virtually or it's in person. Uh, we're starting to have some in-person meetings as as we're as this pandemic is calming down and getting under control. But we get to meet in a um, safe space and kind of share what's been going on with us and have people who listen empathetically and can relate to what we've been going through. Many times, um, in my experience, many times the people who come to these support groups for the first time. It is also the very first time they're able to kind of express their doubts, express their concerns, express the, the things that have been going on, how religion has hurt them. And we're able to just kind of be there for them. Um, like it's the first time they've been able to share that with someone. And it is incredible to see the people coming in just uh, downtrodden and scared, but then walking out with their head held high. And I love it. It, it just, it's just the greatest thing. Um, so that's the peer support groups. Um, we've talked about the helpline and we've also talked about support group. Those are both peer, peer support. That's nothing like professional level at all. We don't have that kind of training here at RFR. However, if you need some professional help, uh, we could we've set up the Secular Therapy Project. And this is where um, licensed therapists um, have applied to be a part of this directory that we can connect with them. And they have to go through a rigorous set of uh, vetting. Um, vetting for uh, to make sure that they have the appropriate license in their state or in their country. They need to be vetted to make sure that they maintain an exclusive use of uh, evidence-based treatments. And but wait, there's more. <laughs> but <laughs> they also need to ensure that they are running a secular practice. So the folks who are referred to the, the um, folks in the secular therapy project will not run the risk of being proselytized to, uh, you know, wasting an hour, wasting a hundred, wasting 300 bucks. And um, right now we have passed 600 registered therapists and 30 thousand registered clients. So as you can imagine, we really kind of need more therapists. So if you're out there uh, looking to kind of get some clientele and you're a secular therapist, um, consider applying to the Secular Therapy Project. I'm going to drop a link into the chat for the Secular Therapy Project. Oh, and here's that. All right. Next up, online community. One of the things that we were kind of missing, this is one of the most uh, recent programs, is kind of the sense of community, a place where people who kind of have similar outlooks or similar experiences, similar experiences can gather together and talk through and help one another. And so what we've done is we set up an online community, the Recovering from Religion online community. Um, it is a really fantastic community. There are thousands of people in there and they're uh, either chatting with one another or they're kind of just looking through all the different messages that sees, uh, just see what applies for them. But like what I had said, um, the, they all kind of share common experiences. We have a ton of different channels in this Slack workspace that we're using as the online community. Um, if you're a member of the LGBTQ community, I may not be able to fully relate 
to the experiences you've had since I'm not necessarily a member of that community, but we've set up a channel for you to talk and connect and um, share with folks or help other folks who have kind of struggling with doubts and uh, non-belief. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just a fantastic community. If that sounds like it's something that you want to do that you kind of need or would like to join, um, head on over to the helpline, the website and chat with one of our agents. They're going to ask you a few questions to see if you're a good fit and then send you an invite. Um, now, uh, the other thing, you guys know what I was coming up next. If you are looking for a fantastic community of non-believers, they're just really active, love to have great conversations and make some great friends. I would encourage you to try out the atheist community of discord folks. It is so fun. And I'm really, really grateful for them because right now they're streaming this show into their discord channel. I've dropped a link into the chat, into the chat. And the link will also be in the YouTube description too. All right, Kara, tell us about volunteering. I would love to. I told you earlier that the helpline is our main source of healing, but actually a lot of people find that volunteering um, is another source of healing for them. And a lot of our volunteers find a lot of meaning and purpose from being able to be involved in that. I know I have. It's been a really great experience for me. And as luck would have it, we're always in need of volunteers because this whole thing is run by volunteers. Nobody's getting paid to do any of this. All of the programs we just described are run by volunteers. So if any of those sounded like they Things that you might be interested in helping out with or where you have some skills that you could contribute, we would love to hear from you. And all you have to do is go to our website, recoveringfromreligion.org slash volunteer, and you can check out what it would take to get involved in volunteering. We offer training um, for some of the positions and things like that. But also, if you have some other skills that you can contribute, we are probably in need of whatever those skills are. Maybe you're good at, at helping people, you know, listening and things like that. Maybe you're good at, at operating the technologies or doing the social medias or project management, whatever it is, um, we're always looking for volunteers. So if that's something that interests you, check it out and see if there's a place we can find for you. And with that said, I think we're about done with our announcements. So let's talk about what we're doing tonight. Um, as always, uh, we've got our show that's going to go for about an hour. We're going to have our discussion with our fabulous guest, and I cannot wait. And then after that, um, we'll have Q&A for about 20 or 30 minutes. And in order for us to have Q&A, we need to have some questions. So during the presentation, if you have some questions that you would like to ask, go ahead and just type those into the chat. And Eric and I will be collecting those. And then when we get to the end of the talk, uh, we'll go through some of those questions, as many as we have time to get to. Um, and so it also helps us out if you have a question, write the word question, and then type your question in the chat. And then we'll, we'll be collecting those, like I said. OK, and then after that, we'll hear our closing thoughts from the fabulous Helen Green, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit at the end. Uh, and then we'll move into our Hangout session, which is where we turn off the recording and we allow everybody to actually chat and interact um, and talk about, you know, continue the conversation from the discussion or other topics that are on your mind. And that can go sometimes late into the evening. So be sure and stick around for that. And that is it. Eric, are you ready to kick this pig? Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Folks, I am so excited to bring you to you today. Dr. Del Rey, he is the founder and president of Recovering from Religion, and he has been a psychologist for over 30 years, way older, way longer than I am old. Just kidding. <laughs> you for almost said years. that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he is the author of four books, including The God Virus, How Religion Effect Infects our lives and culture, as well as sex and God, how religion distorts sexuality. Dr. Ray has been a student of religion for most of his life and holds a master's degree in religion, as well as a bachelor's degree in sociology, anthropology with a doctorate in psychology. Dr. Del Ray, it's so glad, I'm so glad to have you back. Thank you so much for doing this again for us. Good to be back. And I'm really sorry to disappoint you uh, because I'm not going to be talking about duck penises tonight. But oh, oh no. I know. I know. Uh, the whole but, reason whose we're penises here. are you going to be talking about today? <laughs> Yours. <laughs> Can we talk about the echidna four headed penis then, yeah. at least? <laughs> uh, well, that's another talk. You could go look that one up. But. Uh, I've had several people ask me what kind of duck or duck penises are we doing tonight, and I just uh, that's not the subject tonight. So we will we will move past that. So I'm sharing my screen. Do you I, like to take a look at the poll results, Doctor Ray? 
Oh, yeah, I just did. It looks like we have some real sex addicts in here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Looks like, uh, tw- yeah, go ahead, Eric. Take a look at it. Tell people. You bet. Uh, so the first question, have you ever been told that you're a sex addict? Um, 23%, about a quarter of the people said yes. The vast majority, 68% said no, and 9% weren't really sure. Uh, question number two, were you taught that porn would ruin your marriage? Uh, the vast majority again said yes, 61%. I'm surprised it wasn't 69% that said yes, but 61% <laughs> said yes. Uh, 28 said no, and 12 were not sure. Uh, and then if you're a sex addict, you clearly have had, and we had an even split between two, 10, 50, and 100 sex partners, and those all hovered around 5%. But the most of the people kind of knew, uh, saw this coming, and seventy-five uh, percent said none of the above. So it might have been like fifty-one, or. Uh... <laughs> and then the final um, question: Religious people have fewer affairs and use porn less than non-religious people. Uh, everybody, like eighty-nine percent, said false. That is not true, and eleven percent, the remaining, said true. Those are the poll results, my friend. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, let me get this started here. I am so glad that you put a picture of me on your book. I, you know, that's just <laughs> real nice. That is exactly uh, what my back looks like. And <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right. I would encourage you to read either one of my books or both. But of course, a lot of what we're talking about will come up out of Sex and God. But there's other things we're going to be throwing in here, too. And I'm going to recommend some other books and articles as we go through tonight. <clears throat> Anyway, I, I want you to have the ideas and uh, tools that you need to thrive in your own sexuality and your sexual expression, free of religious dogma. So we're going to be challenging some myths, some ideas that you probably were, were raised with. So uh, first of all, let's just acknowledge that May is an International Masturbation Month. And I have to thank uh, John uh, Lionheart on the uh, online community for reminding me of that, not that I needed reminding, but he wasn't gonna let me forget it. So so if you haven't achieved a masturbatory orgasm this month, you've still got um, about three weeks to to get that done. But of course, we we encourage you to do it all the time, anytime you want to do that. So here's my question to you tonight. Do you masturbate? And uh, you don't have to answer that. You can ra- raise your hand. I will raise my hand. I masturbate. I started masturbating when I was like 11 years old. I haven't stopped since. It just, I, I must be a true sex addict, according to what we're going to learn here tonight. If you masturbate, then you are a sex addict, according to the Catholic Church. And I have on video, I'm not going to show it to you tonight, on video, these, the national spokesperson for the cat, the lay social um, spokesperson for the Catholic Church saying, if you if you have masturbated or if you've looked at porn even one time, you are a sex addict. Those are him, his words, the main represent, lay representative of the Catholic Church. Uh, of course, we've got Mark Driscoll, the head of the Mars Hill Church, who himself has had some sexual problems telling any man who looks at himself in the mirror and masturbates is clearly a sex addict. Now, I never thought to look in the mirror and masturbate in in my life, but evidently Mark Driscoll has, and he's telling everybody else that would be a sin under under his theology. And of course, most fundamentalist groups, I'm sure the Jehovah's Witnesses do not like masturbation. Am I correct, Sasha? Yep, so, uh, and I could go on and on. There's so much. so many religions that condemn it in, in one shape, way, shape, or form. And yet, it is a perfectly normal human behavior. In fact, it's a perfectly normal human behavior for all primates. It, we can find masturbatory behavior in virtually every primate we know about. So uh, what, what we're going to do tonight is kind of identify the roots of sex and porn addiction. Uh, and where did the concept come from? How how I want to try to explain how it's destructive to your own healthy sexuality. I want to discuss some of the science or lack thereof in the whole notion of sex addiction and research behind it. We're going to examine underlying sexual issues, and uh, we're going to explore why this is important for you and those whom you might love. So is there a problem? I'm going to show you a video here uh, that I actually did. This is Australian uh, 
Sasha, this is the Australian Broadcasting Network. You might have seen this before, but let's see what, it's just a clip that um, I think you'll find interesting. We'll talk about it when I finish. What does Australia say about sex addiction? addiction? Well, uh, they show us some evangelical Christians who are concerned about their sex ad addictions and uh, how they're praying for Jesus and reading the Bible and going to courses on how not to masturbate anymore. So that's what Australia <laughs> broadcasts. And then, of course, they have a psychologist who seems to be kind of fucked up herself. She thinks there is such a thing as sex addiction, and she's uh, helping these poor evangelicals um, get better at Jesus stuff. And she's a, supposedly a psychologist there in Australia. But we are not going to worry about that because I'm going to move on. Uh, this, this boat is leaving... Uh oh, are are we doing boat puns again tonight? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> oh great. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what we would have heard in this video is there were religious purity themes. There was a shame. The the woman shamed her husband for masturbating. She caught him masturbating, and forced him to go to some kind of a class so that he could learn not to. Uh, there was a whole denial of sexuality in the in the video, even though this is. <laughs> Yeah, it's a public television station basically denying that people should be behaving like this. And then there was a very interesting, the, the wife in the relationship uh, they used was, pretend, was, was behaving much like a strict mother uh, over her own husband saying, you know, you can't, you know, you're, you're a sex addict because I caught you masturbating because I caught you using pornography. So she's, it's a parent-child relationship. The wife is now the mother of this guy, shaming him for, for masturbating. And uh, the psychologist comes on and claims that they, all these people are true sex addicts. And yet, when challenged, she can't identify any diagnostic criteria. We'll come back to that. So that's what the video would have shown. In 1983, a, a psychologist named Patrick Carnes came up with a brilliant idea, marketing idea, I guess, to coin the term sex addiction. And he wrote a, several books. In fact, he writes about a book every three or four years on sex addiction. <clears throat> and he's, he is the one that started this whole notion of sex addiction. Uh, it's, it's all his doing. You can go back before 1983 and find probably zero references to the notion of sex addiction. So he single-handedly started this notion or close to single-handedly started it. Well. When Dr. Carnes, uh, he's got a whole website around this um, issue and you can go on his website and you can take tests and you can find out if you're a sex addict or not. Now it's a, it's a test I've literally got in front of me. I, I copied it off and uh, if I'm giving this talk in, in a big room with public, I hand this out before and I ask everybody to do this, this um, test before I start talking. <clears throat> And then about halfway through, I will help them score it. And then I'll ask them, stand up if you're a sex addict, according to this survey. I did this in Tulsa, Oklahoma, four or five years ago. And over half of the people stood up. In other words, they scored sex addict level on this test. Over half the people in the room. Now, the people in the room were just people like you and I. They were just humanists. They were just atheists. Or they were just people recovering from religion. But Dr. Carnes has created a test that will pretty much identify a, a majority of people on this planet as sex addicts. Now, if I was, uh, and, and this is the scoring system, if you even get between one and six items on this, if you check between one and six items, you have to be truly concerned. In other words, out of like, 40 uh, 25 items on here. If you check between one and six, you might be a sex addict. If you so check basically, between... sorry. So basically, yeah. everyone needs this guy's book. Is is what this yeah, test yeah. reveals? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or treatment, or or needs to go get therapy with the people he is trained. You know. So here's some of the here's some of the. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know that some of you may be sex addicts according to his thing. Uh, I, here's one question on there. Have you subscribed or regularly purchased rented sex or rented sexually explicit magazines or videos? Uh, okay. <laughs> Did your parents have trouble with their sexual or romantic behaviors? Uh, do you often find yourself preoccupied with sexual thoughts? 
Now, I'm just reading three out. That's just three out of the first four. And it goes on and on and on. This is a, a, a college senior majoring in psychology could have made a better test than this. And I want to tell you, this is the state of the art. This is a standard test that many, many, many people use to determine if you're a, a sex addict. It's, it's crazy how primitive this is. And the fact is the questions are all couched in such a way that you would never look for what's behind the curtain here, so to speak. And we're gonna get back to what's behind the curtain. So I wanna show you in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the, um, the, the, the manual for um, creating criteria and using criteria for diagnosing um, issues around mental, mental illness, mental wellness and all. And I wanna show you the three criteria that are in the DSM-5, that's the most recent Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM-5. Here are the three criteria for sex addiction. Number one, number two, and number three. In other words, there are no criteria. You cannot find sex addiction in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. That's not because people haven't tried, but for years, years, people have, there's been three different committees who have studied the issue of how do we diagnose sex addiction three different times it's been done and nobody can come up with reasonable, measurable, and most important scientific criteria for deter determining what, what, do, what uh, makes a sex addict. Now this pisses some people off because as that psychologist you would have seen in the video had I been able to share it, or this, um, this um, marriage and family counselor I, I, I copied here, they're pissed because they believe that there is such thing as a sex addiction. I mean, it's kind of like, I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So it should be in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. That's how much proof they have for the notion of sex addiction. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm making quite a few statements here that I'll come back and, and underline and, and uh, put some meat behind them. But the fact is there is no criteria do you want to go into your doctor and he looks at you and examines your symptoms and says, I think you're, I think you're possessed by a demon. Would, would that be a reasonable diagnosis? Your doctor is going to diagnose you based upon the symptoms, whatever those symptoms are. You got a source, uh, you got a, a upset stomach, you know, you're breathing fast, your heart rate's fast. You know, there's something going on that they can scientifically evaluate. Well, there's nothing we can evaluate around sex addiction. And it is pissing a lot of oftentimes religiously motivated people off because they think it should be in there. But like I said, three very high quali highly qualified committees have looked at it. They can find nothing they can agree upon that would qualify. So Dr. Alan Francis, probably the foremost person in diagnosis in the entire world, was actually the chairperson for the last revision of the DSM-4. He says this, sexuality is an inherently difficult area for psychiatric diagnosis because one, the field has generated remarkably little research and few researchers. Two, there are no consensus norms in sexual behavior to provide a useful boundary in deciding what constitutes a sexual mental disorder. Number three, individual and cultural biases play a large and difficult to sort out role. And four, decisions regarding the diagnosis of sexual disorders can have profound and unanticipated forensic and societal implications. In other words, one of the experts in the whole world on diagnosis says, this is fucking dangerous. We don't wanna just be slapping a diagnosis on something unless we really know what we're talking about. And we'll come back to understand why that's so important. His biggest concern was poorly defined diagnosis can have lifelong consequences in the legal, criminal, and mental health areas. Bad criteria will lead to more people being indefinitely imprisoned and involve psychi psychiatry in a sham science. So there's the underlying thing we're going to look at tonight. This is sham science, and it has real-world consequences for the people who are labeled 
like this and may not always end up in prison, but it certainly can disrupt relationships. It can upset people's own view of their bodies and stuff like that. So we want to understand what we're doing here. If we're going to be throwing around these labels, uh, the, the label. So let's begin with understanding what's going on. Purity culture also started big time with the rise of the, of the religious right, Jerry Falwell in the late 70s, early 80s. So Patrick Carnes and his notion of sex addiction really, really facilitated or was a component of this purity culture that preaches abstinence only um, to, to uh, religious adherents. It sets an impossible standard, and then they, it makes people feel ashamed and shameful and guilty about you know, their normal natural behavior. Uh, I don't know if you've <laughs> just heard about the purity culture balls. This is a picture of a father with his daughter at a purity culture ball where they put rings. The father puts a ring on the girl and she promises never to have sex before she gets married um, and that sort of stuff. It's really, really creepy uh, in my estimation. It's also based on the Alcoholics Anonymous model of abstinence as the only option. And it also encourages a helplessness model. You are, that's what abstinence, um, that's what AA encourages. You are helpless. You gotta have a God up there to help you get through your addiction. So once you frame all this, there's no way out. You are stuck inside of this shame-based shame culture that tells you your body is your enemy and you're going to hell or you're being, uh, you're being tempted by Satan, any of those kinds of things. This is the man I told you about earlier, uh, Matt Fred, Christian apologist for the Catholic Church. You can even read his whole thing on a blog that came out some years ago in J.T. Everhart's blog. But he said, masturbation is bad because you might fantasize. And fantasizing is bad if it has anything to do with sex. So uh, according to Matt Fred, I'm guessing that about 95% or more of the people listening to my voice right now are sex addicts, according to him. If you watch porn, you are a porn addict. Simple. It's pretty simple. That's in his view. Now, of course, this guy has never looked at porn in his whole life. We can all believe that, I'm sure. <clears throat> so what are the consequences of this ideology? And that's what it is. It is an ideology. It makes people think they are addicted when they're acting like normal human beings. <clears throat> it evokes blame and labels on people who are behaving like normal humans. It opens a door to religious shame and guilt under the guise of counseling. And yes, Christian counselors will counsel you all day long about how you shouldn't, you shouldn't masturbate. It's uh, going against Jesus and that sort of stuff. It promotes anti-science agenda in the practice of psychology and counseling. This kind of stuff creeps in. As I said, a full-blown, apparently licensed psychology in Australia came on the same show I was on in Australia and said that there's, there is such a thing as sex addiction. And yet she couldn't cite any criteria for her diagnosis. How did she diagnose these people if she does not have a criteria for that diagnosis? So let's talk about the sex addiction research. Well, <laughs> from 1983 on, since Dr. Carnes wrote that book, there has been virtually no sex research. The research to date does not meet the criteria for basic science. Therefore, None can be found in the major psychology journals. You can search all the major peer-reviewed psychology journals. You will not find any valid or useful research on sex addiction. And the test that I read to you or the part I read to you earlier is still the standard, as I said earlier, still the standard today. So who is doing the diagnosing? As we all know, Tiger, Wood got, um, Tiger Woods got diagnosed as a sex addict. Well, who diagnosed him? Was it the media? Was it his spouse? Could it have been parents? How about a preacher or other religious authorities? Could he have identified himself as a sex addict? Sex addiction counselors are almost always religious. There's, there's over and over again, I've met so many sex addiction counselors and they all have a religious agenda. But if you look at this, 
do you notice in that list I just listed, do you see any anyone who's a true, truly certified psychologist in diagnostics? Do you see anyone in there that probably read the DSM-5 and came up with a diagnosis? No, because there is no diagnosis for sex addiction. But we do hear spouses saying their partners are sex addicts. How does, how does a husband or a wife diagnose their partner as a sex addict? Well, I'll tell you, a sex addict is anyone that's having more and better sex than I am. That's pretty much the way people determine it. So it uses the addictions industry model. And, re and in that industry, there's woefully inadequate research. For example, there's no peer-reviewed research in the last 50 years, and probably we could even say 80 years, that shows Alcoholics Anonymous works as a treatment for alcoholism. It, there's no evidence it works. You can argue with people all day, but if you look at it, Alcoholics Anonymous is simply a religion. And re you can't argue with religious people frequently because they already know. There's no need for science there. And that's kind of the way Alcoholics Anonymous treats it. There's no scientific research for the notion of sex addiction either. And even though people will swear up and down, they were once a sex addict until they got Jesus, or they were once a sex addict until they went to a Christian counselor or whatever, there's still no diagnosis for it. There's no peer reviewed research that shows that abstinence works for Alcoholics Anonymous or for Sex uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Both, both groups ask or require abstinence. And there, the research does not show that abstinence actually works. Now you can find many, many people that say, I went to AA and it worked for me. Okay, great. How many people didn't go to AA and it worked for them? Nobody keeps track of that. So the question is, could you have found a, another way to change the problematic behavior? Is AA the treat, a treatment modality? And the easy answer to that is no, because we don't have any research that shows it works just like we don't have any research that shows that sex addiction uh, counseling works. Dr. Ray? Yeah. Are there, is there peer-reviewed research showing that abstinence doesn't work? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, there's kind of some of that research. What we, I, even my own research found that, um, for example, in the purity culture ball, purity culture ring thing, that kids who made the purity pledge withheld sexual activity roughly three months longer than kids who did not take the purity culture, but both groups e engaged equally in sexual activity, premarital sexual activity after about six uh, months to a year after once it started. So yeah, it, what, it what it seems to indicate, our research indicated that, but there's other research besides ours, uh, what the research seems to say is you can get a kid to say, no, I won't have sex before marriage. And that may help them delay it by three months. But after that, they go, they go wild anyway, because it's the hormones. Hormones are really, really hard to resist. And it doesn't mean you can't channel the hormones, but abstinence is not a way to channel it, especially if you're saying you also can't masturbate. You're going to hell if you masturbate. So you're cutting off all avenues of sexual expression to somebody you can't have sex outside of marriage and you can't masturbate well what's a poor person going to do probably going to lead to some dysfunctional behavior i'm just guessing so that i hope that answers your question a little bit yes there, thank right? you so here's the deal we're using a model that has never been proven and i'm referring to the alcoholism model the notion that alcoholism is a disease and they'll progress until you die there is no evidence for that I am not saying people don't have lifelong problems with drugs. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying most people get over their addiction. And there's a lot of research that shows that they do. And they get over it with or without professional help or without, with or without Alcoholics Anonymous or with or without Sexaholics Anonymous. So it's a popular opinion, but it's a popular opinion based upon the ideology of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or Sexaholics Anonymous. All these groups use the same model. Here's some, the early research in 1962 by, uh, by uh, Dr. Charles Winnicke. He noted, he, he did a, a massive study 
clear back in 1962 that showed that that vast majority of people who were addicted, to, especially to alcohol, got over that addiction within a three-year time period. That research has withheld the test of time over and over again. More and more research shows this. Now, I again, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying people don't have trouble with drugs, don't have trouble with sex even, but most people are who would be identified as an alcoholic this year get over it and are not alcoholic the next year within a year within two years so how did they get out of it they didn't go to aa the fact is it's a lot harder to stop the addiction to tobacco than it is to many other things and nobody's talking about you know how terrible that is well we do but not in the way we talk about other things cocaine for example it seems to be easier for people to spontaneously uh, cure them, quote, cure themselves of a cocaine addiction than it is to cure themselves of tobacco. It, it's really hard to get over a smoking addiction. So it, this, this, is a, this is nuanced. I don't want anybody listening to me here today say that these don't cause problems. We, <laughs> that's obvious. But the identification of the problem, the diagnosis of the problem, and the treatment of the problem, those are important components to take in consideration. Let's not let pop psychology tell us how to diagnose our next door neighbor or our spouse. Let's find other ways to do that. So uh, there is this is what's called the addictions paradox, that most people mature out of their addiction within three years. I'm pretty sure I have a lot of people hearing my voice right now who at one time were abusing alcohol and they're not doing it now. Somehow they got over it. And I'll bet a lot of them, a lot of the people listening to me right now did not go to a therapist to get over their alcohol, quote, addiction. Yes, they were abusing alcohol, but you got to ask some questions. What might have led to that? And what we also know is that people seem to age out. That's why we don't see a lot of people at the age of 40 behaving crazy and abusing things that they did when they were 23 or 16 or whatever. So there's just no research that show, supports the pop culture notions about addictions, whether it's sex addictions or drug addictions. Not to say that they're not problems, but the research does not show that they're lifelong problems using the AA model. You know, AA says, once you're an addict, you're always an addict. You gotta keep going to AA meetings uh, one day at a time, one step at a time. That's the ideology of AA. It's also the ideology of sex uh, holics in an anonymous. So there is no research among in these areas of any consequence because Alcoholics Anonymous, AA and, uh, and Sexholics Anonymous don't want the research. It is actually designed in such a way that it would be very difficult to actually research people who go through these programs. What, what it looks like is only about 3% who, only about 3% of the people who actually start um, a program like Alcoholics Anonymous finish any in any meaningful way finish it. So how many hundreds of people go in for the three people that come out healed supposedly? It's it's a um, uh, Rob Palmer being our skeptic here would understand exactly what I'm saying there. We we're looking at the few and forgetting the many. It's we're we're taking the the positive hits and ignoring all the negative uh, hits. Information bias at the extreme. Thank you. Ab absolutely, it is absolutely. So there are really these are really religions masquerading as science. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous looks and sounds like when you get down to the bottom. It's it's not science. It's a religion. And if you don't believe me, here's the Sexaholics Anonymous, twelve steps. Do you notice any uh, religious stuff in there? Uh, powerless power. God. 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 Him. Prayer, God, him. <laughs> it's a fucking religion. Do you see any science in here? Do you see any cognitive behavioral approaches to understanding how our own systems, brains, and, and behavior work? No, none of that's there. So I want you to recognize that the treatment modalities that have been pushed down our throats for decades 
are nothing more than an alternative religion. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous, that's sexaholics. And the reason they're so successful is the same reason religions are successful. They, they tap in to this need for magical thinking or to our magical thinking. So um, why has sex addiction become so popular? I call it the Oprah effect. Oprah has somebody on her show and Oprah claims that there's such a thing as sex addiction. And lo and behold, the whole world is starting to see sex addiction. Well, is Paris Hilton a sex addict? She sure seems to like a lot of sex, but everybody's saying she's a sex addict. So it's, I think it's important for us to recognize as humanists that sex addiction is a weapon that the religious right is using to combat liberalism and to ignore the science and to ignite fear in our own uh, of our own bodies and of our own biological tendencies it helps legitimize legitimize anti-sex moralism and bigotry and psychologists judges legislatures and the media are buying it dr marty klein wrote an incredibly good book a few years back called America's War on Sex, where he really documents over and over again how much the political system is supporting this notion of sex addiction and, and uh, sexual expression that's not unencumbered by government, basically. It's a, it's a well worth read, it's a book well worth reading. So what is the harm here? Well, we got here on the right, Senator David Vintner, who uh, a Republican out of Louisiana who seemed to enjoy having prostitutes on a regular basis until he got caught. And of course, he gets shamed by everybody. And what does he do? What does Dr. What does David Vitter do? He says, I must be a sex addict. I'm going to go off to a sex addiction treatment center and get cured and come back. And the guy still is in the Senate or he got reelected in 2010. I'm not sure where he is right now. Yeah, he got another term after he got caught routinely visiting prostitutes. Now I am positive about, I, I have no problems with sex workers and I'm very sex positive. It's just that David Vitter is very anti-LGBTQ. David Vitter hates prostitutes. David Vitter doesn't like people who masturbate. I mean, there's a lot of things this guy is against and yet he's performing those very behaviors himself. So what we see is people are labeling each other as sex addicts and the people who get labeled, in order to escape the shame that is produced by this label, they, they use the word sex addiction to get treatment and then come back uh, into the world. It's a way of, it's a get out of jail free card. So people are self-diagnosing, they're perpetuating the myth of the, uh, the, nor the myths I've already talked about, about the progression of the quote disease. Spouses are diagnosing each other partners are diagnosing each other and the so-called sex addiction professionals are going are going to the bank they are making lots of money on the diagnosis of sex addiction but it's all an underlying hidden agenda so uh, one of the things we find is uh, there are several corporations that have created something that says basically a piece of spy software to ensure that your spouse is not looking at porn so this is nanny, nanny software. You can install it secretly on your computer or your spouse's computer, and it'll tell you if they're looking at porn or not. So then you can confront them and show them that they're a porn addict, porn addict and then we can get treatment for them. That, this is fucking crazy. This, this is the height of spying on people and shaming them uh by just using their own behavior and that's what that's what covenant eyes does and there's several of these they're called nanny nanny software so if you're a you're a, a in this case a woman you want to know is my husband looking at porn then she can install this and condemn him and uh, send him off to treatment <clears throat> this is uh Another Center for Healthy Sex. Uh, nothing I could find in this Center for Healthy Sex said anything looked healthy to me. This is basically an anti-masturbation, anti-porn site, and it's <clears throat> it's a mental health professional putting themselves out here. So 
supposedly with a license and, and with uh, the qualifications to do it. But basically what she's saying is you better watch out. You could be masturbating too much. And again, you can take their little test. I was uh, just driving down the road. This is several years ago, back in 2013. And I heard come on the radio, KCUR is a local PBS station. And I heard this PhD psychologist talking about sex addiction. I, I couldn't stop my car fast enough. I pulled off the road. I got my phone ready. I was going to call in when they got to the question and answer time period. Well, I did. I called in and I waited and I waited and I waited. And I know I was one of the first two or three people to call in. They never had time for me, unfortunately. It ran out of time. They did not want me to talk to this woman because she was saying all sorts of shit. And she just had a new book out on your sexually addicted spouse, how partners can cope and heal. That was the name of her book. And of course, she's promoting this book. And she had a minister on the show with her. I was livid. I wrote a long letter to the to the um, uh, radio station, and they never replied. I basically said, if you're going to push this kind of pseudoscience, then let me come on and talk about it, too. Uh, they never responded at all. This person, I went and looked up her qualifications. She has a PhD in psychology from Regents University. That is Pat Robertson's university, where they teach that gays can cause hurricanes. And she had... She had degrees from two other religious colleges too, but she is a super, she is a PhD in supervision, counselor supervision and education from in 2005. This is a, this is a PhD level person who actually has a license in her state. And yet she is pushing non-scientific stuff. Now, let me tell you, if you go to Regents University, you are told masturbation is wrong. You're also given one year of education in Pat Robertson's theology, which of course is pretty screwed up theology, all mainly anti-LGBTQ kind of theology. So who is she and why would you ever want to go to somebody that like that for treatment of something that has no diagnosis in the first place, of course. The religious fundamentalists are really into this because it keeps them away from the secular therapist and pulls them into their in, into their um, area. I went to the Regents PhD program. I wanted to see, okay, what are they advertising? I'm just going to read the highlighted part. Our curriculum trains psychologists in a manner consistent with biblical truths and historic Christian worldview. Wow, that sounds real scientific. At the bottom, in this course, students can expect the instructor to both guide and join students in understanding the role and effect of the fallen human condition on mental health and well being. So we're not going to study cognitive behavioral science or neuroscience. We're going to study the Bible, basically. So this woman has a PhD in psychology, and she looks legit. She sounds legit. It's pretty crazy. This is dangerous out there. So as you can see from what I've already shown you, the sex addiction feel is really a form of religious indoctrination and shaming, especially for men. It recruits women and helps women participate in the shaming of their husbands. We see this nanny software being marketed primarily to women. And then those women turn around, and install it on their children and on their husbands uh, to snoop and spy upon them. And it's closely tied to churches. Uh, lots of these, uh, you know, once you install the software, then you get results. And then the results will say, hey, there's a, there's a um, spouse support group neck in, in the Baptist church down the road from you. And you can go on Tuesday night and meet with all the other Baptist women who installed nanny software on their computers. And they have a problem with their husband looking at porn too. <laughs> this, is, this is something out of 1984. If, if you think about it. it, it's, it's, if you've ever read that book, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's, there's so many people pushing this shit. Dr. Drew has made an entire career on misdiagnosing people on the addictions industry. And he's just a charlatan. I don't care what angle you look at. The guy has made millions off of other people's misery. And then we get to children. There are, there are, this notion of sex addiction has really become a big and uh, more fundamentalist and Mormon kinds of of uh, religions 
And so parents are getting concerned. I caught my boy masturbating. What do I do? Well, let me tell you, if your boy isn't masturbating, he's probably one of the few on the planet that's not. If your girl is not masturbating, they're one of the few on the planet. We know that probably somewhere around 95 plus percent of all boys do or will masturbate. Probably somewhere in 80 to 85 percent of all girls do or will masturbate. So this is this is about as normal behavioral as you can get. And yet parents are getting all up, up and at them about porn addiction or sex addiction. And they're sending boys, 12 to 18 year old boys off to these Mormon based schools. Now they don't say they're Mormon. They'll always say they're secular, but they're staffed by 100% Mormons. The ones I've looked at 100% Mormons and they're sending boys and they're labeling these boys and a few girls, but mostly boys get sent here. They're labeling them as sex addicts. A sex addict at 12 years old, you know, he just got a high sex drive. He just got a lot of hormones. What's he supposed to do with them? That's pretty much what's going on, on here. Now, what is that kid going to do? He's going to go there. Here's the interesting thing about these, these um, treatment centers. And I put that in quotes. These treatment centers are taking insurance money from the parents' insurance to treat these boys. Now, insurance will not, ex will not pay for something that doesn't have a diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So what these organizations do is they bring the boy in, they diagnose him as depressed or something like that for insurance purposes, and then they treat the boy for sex addiction. That is abusive. That is absolutely horrible because they're treating a kid for what he's not. And they're not treating him properly for depression if he is depressed. And, you know, who's, who diagnosed it in the first place? It was the damn parents who sent him there. And they're not going to say, oh, you, your kid doesn't have, you, does not have sex addiction. We're going to send him home. That's not going to, that's not a good business model. So once the kid gets there, the parents have diagnosed him as sex addict. And now you can be damn sure those staff members are going to, label him as a sex addict or find a way to to put that label on him or something similar now people have started using hypersexuality syndrome or something like that more recently and there there has been an effort to look at that i'm not going to go there right now that's a that's a, a different issue but it, it has some potential scientific basis but it's still pretty touchy but right now we're just saying the notion of sex addiction so what are the qualifications of these counselors? You notice Brigham Young University in there? If you go to Brigham Young University, before you can even get in, you have to sign a statement of faith and behavior. One of the things it says is you cannot have sex outside of marriage. Another thing it says you can't masturbate. So we've got these two men here running an organization uh, for, for adolescent boys, and they themselves were taught throughout their entire clinical training, and this is a legitimate university, entire clinical training that masturbation is wrong against God and all that sort of bullshit. This is, this is child abuse at a new level in some ways. I dare say most of the kids that come out of these places are going to have real damage around their sexuality in some way, shape, or form. So, so, like I said earlier, there is since 1983, there's no credible research that shows these kinds of programs work because there's no criteria. There's no recidivism studies. There's no randomized studies. There's no double blind studies. There's no long term follow up studies. In other words, there's no studies. There's no research. Got it? All right. So, sex and porn addiction are a disease, but they're a disease of religion. If you eliminate the religious notions and sex-related problems are often much easier to treat, all you have to do is get rid of the fact that your body is your enemy. That alone, just you're not guilty and shame. You're not born with original sin. Get rid of that shit. And you, we can treat whatever the underlying issue is because the, the sexual behavior oftentimes is superficial. It's, the, it's what we see. We aren't looking at what's causing it underneath. Um, my good friend, Dr. Marty Klein, wrote a great article on, uh, 
he, it, you can just Google it. You're addicted to what? He published it in the American Humanist magazine about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. It's probably the quickest summary of the stupidity of, um, of uh, sex addiction. He's also written a couple of good books. Uh, his sexual intelligence books is also excellent. But the American's War on Sex really goes to what we're talking about here today. Do um, you remember Anthony Weiner? You know, he was sending... He was sending pictures of his wiener, if you will, <laughs> to uh, to women who did not want them, and he got caught. He ended up resigning from Congress. What did he do? He says, "I'm a sex addict," and then he went off to treatment to be a, from for sex addiction and came back, and he's cured. I mean, this is a get out of jail free card. He was he was abusing women. He was without without uh, permission sending things to women and that is inappropriate it's it may have even been criminal and if he claims he's a sex addict he gets out of jail free look at the duggers josh and <laughs> jim bob but D josh duggar when he was caught you know he he abused three of his sisters and then a, a friend of the family sexually abused these women and he also got caught looking at pornography when all this came out what did, what was the first thing he said i'm a sex addict and he went off to get treatment now when he went to get treatment it wasn't to even a legitimate sex addiction treatment it was just a friend of theirs who happened to uh, uh think he could treat uh josh so he went off for six months and came back of course a couple of years later he gets caught with child pornography on his computer and now he's in jail but the pattern is pretty clear if you think about it. If you get in trouble, just claim you're a sex addict, go get treatment, and you get out of jail free. You do not have to deal with the, the underlying issues. You don't have to admit, yeah, it was criminal behavior, and I should probably go to jail for it. You know, that, that's, that's irrelevant because you're a sex addict, and we want to understand you have a disease, just like Alcoholics Anonymous. So what you'll see is uh, somebody will say, well, I'm... Um, you know, they do something wrong under the influence of alcohol and they'll plead to the judge. I'm an alcoholic. I need to go get treatment. And the judge will give them a, you know, give them a pass. As long as you go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, you'll, we won't put you in jail. Well, <laughs> the same thing's happening here. As long as you say you're a sex addict and go get treatment, we won't put you in jail. But that's, that's not treating the underlying issues. So uh, I want to recommend this book, Dr. David Lay's book, published in 2012, but I'm telling you, it's as good today as it was the day it was published. And that is, he goes over a lot of what we're talking about here. The fact is, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. There's no more diagnosis. We are not any closer to getting a diagnosis than we were in 2012. So if you want to really understand everything I'm saying, go to that book. Um, was this guy a sex addict? Everybody says Bill Clinton was a sex addict. What Dr. Lay, David Lay says in his book is a diagnosis of sex addiction is superfluous at best and a dangerous distraction from the real treatment needed at worst. It's easier to say that sex is the problem rather than trying to identify the individual issues that might lead an individual to sex-related problems. Again, I'm going to emphasize, I am not saying people don't have sex-related problems, but if I see a boil on my skin I don't say, oh, I've got a boil disease. No, I'm going to look at the underlying issue. Is there a bacterial infection? That's, that's diagnosis. I'm going to take some tests and find out if there's a virus, if there's something else going on. That's looking at the root cause. Sex addiction looks at the behavior. It does not consider what is the root cause. We'll get to that in a minute. Is this guy a sex addict? Hey, if there was ever a sex addict on the planet, I'm thinking this guy is. He openly brags about sexually assaulting people. He's a close friend of Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein, who killed himself because he was a sex for whatever. And this guy walks into women's dressing rooms unannounced and brags about it. He's been married three times and had und and told numbers of sexual affairs. And yet nobody's talking about Donald Trump being a sex addict, especially among the evangelical world. But it seems to me if their, you know, if their spouse did this, they would be saying, yeah, my spouse is a sex addict. 
So it's religiously motivated. Uh, Michelle Bachman, <laughs> her husband has a whole organization that helps you pray the gay away. It's, and according to uh, Dr. Lay, here's what he says, sex addiction is the latest tool of an anti-sex morality embedded in our culture at its deepest levels, labeling sexuality as a dangerous evil temptation that must be constantly constrained and feared. And who is afraid of sex more than Michelle and Marcus Bachman? They've done everything they can to implement legislation, including anti-gay, anti-abortion, all that sort of stuff. And they've succeeded, as we can see in some ways. Here is, uh, before, before uh, gay marriage was legalized, this was a survey of Pornhub. I love Pornhub. Their statistics are great. This is a survey of Pornhub that showed where the highest porn searches were and what those porn searches were. Uh, this remember this before it was it was legalized. So the the kind of pinkish um, is states that uh, had legal marriage, and the orange or yellow is where the, it was illegal. So if you then lay over that, where are the highest porn searches, you get them in the Bible Belt. More importantly, I call this the Born Belt. The uh, consistently the research shows that wherever you have the highest religiosity, you also have the highest porn consumption. It's over and over again. These, these results go back as long as, as far back as the internet exists. And probably there's earlier uh, research that, uh, that's been around too. But what we know and what um, has been documented in several major studies, and I'm not just talking Pornhub, is that <laughs> you, can, you can get it down to the zip code how religious is the zip code? And you can then look at the porn searches and find that there, there's a high correlation. So just don't call it the Bible Belt anymore, call it the porn belt. Religious people are very likely to think that they are addicted. I, this is a funny thing. This is an actual photograph of a Republican state senator in Florida looking at porn while they're debating an anti-porn bill that he sponsored. <laughs> Uh, he does not know, of course, that people are watching him. Uh, porn viewing habits uh, were no different between religious and non-religious, but the perception of addiction was closely related to religiosity. In other words, the more religious you are, uh, the more you think you're a porn addict or you're a sex addict. It's, it's very closely related. People seem to watch porn pretty much the same or close to it in a lot of different areas. But it's the religious people that feel guilty about it. Uh, Josh Grubbs, who's a major researcher in this area, says we were surprised that the amount of viewing did not impact the perception of addiction, but strong moral beliefs did. So if you're morally opposed to porn and you're watching it, the cognitive distance seems to get to you. Well, once again, was this guy a sex addict? So the addictions industry has a whole bunch of treatments. One of the main treatments is abstinence only. Moral judgments, which is, it's just replete. Even moral judgments under the guise of science. There's a lot of, quote, scientific sounding language that they use. And they've even got into trying to explain things with neuropsychology, which is bullshit. There's, there's been no real research in this area yet that, that shows anything around sex addiction very poorly defined diagnostic criteria. So if you don't have a diagnosis that won't tell you, then you could use about any treatment method you want. Diagnosis should constrain what, a, what treatment options would be most valuable or useful. And of course, there's tons and tons of religiosity creeping in to what should be um, a, a diagnostic criteria that's scientific. There's all sorts of problems um, it was sexual behavior. Again, I've said this many times. There are problematic sex behavior. But a lot of people are like <laughs> Mae West. She was a sex addict, right? No. I, I love her statement. Uh, I once was pure as snow and then I drifted. I love Mae West. If you haven't watched any of her movies, go back and look at some of those pre-code movies which she's in. You would be shocked at how sexually open the pre-code movies are. And when I say pre-code, I mean from roughly 1929 to about 1934. If you never heard of pre-code, you, you need to go and re research this. It is fascinating. 
the movie industry was extremely sexual and sexy for those four or five years until uh, legislation came down on them. <clears throat> yes, there is problematic sexual behaviors, but they're not the same as addiction. I can have problematic behaviors, I, but I need to understand what's driving those behaviors underneath them. For example, Larry Craig, when he goes into a bathroom, he's the senator from Montana, and he knocks on the door to try and see if somebody wants to have sex with him. And of course, he's very anti-gay. Is this a problematic behavior? Well, he got caught. Yeah. I'm going to give you four different scenarios here. They're just scenarios. After a man is, is divorced, he masturbates four times a day. Is that a problematic behavior? A husband is away on military duty and his wife picks up men at local bars many nights. Is that a problematic behavior? Teenage boys, a teenage boy steals porn magazines from a gas station. Is that a problematic behavior? Single women says she never wants to be married. She prefers affairs with married men. Says they're a lot less troubled. I can, I can, I have, I know people in all of those conditions and they live very successful lives and they don't see their behavior as problematic. They've not ruined anybody's life. They're having, they're doing fine. Uh, and one of those people was me. I stole Playboy from a from a uh, filling station when I was a kid on a dare. Um, I felt guilty as hell about it, of course, because I was a good Christian boy and I shouldn't have done it. But the fact is, people engage in probably bad behaviors or poor behaviors, but that does not make them a sex addict. It means they probably need to clean up their act. I don't go around stealing shit anymore. It's not and you can dare me all my all you want. I'm not going to go rob a bank. <laughs> and I know for a fact as a psychologist, when somebody gets divorced, the, the underlying issue is oftentimes depression. And so what's a treat a self-medication? Masturbation is a good is is a self-medication for that problem. I'm not going to say if it's good or bad, but it is a self-medicating. It's almost like taking drugs because you're depressed. I mean, I that's a problem, but it's not because you're a sex addict. <clears throat> Harmful behavior needs to be treated at, at, and you need to get assistance for it. But a harmful behavior is a behavior that hurts you or other people. It, it's not, it, and the notion of addiction doesn't tell you anything. Addiction labels only add shame and guilt and a destructive moral component that actually causes more harm. It shames people. And when somebody's shamed, they won't get treatment. You can actually push people away from getting appropriate treatment by shaming them. Do you think, do you think the husband whose wife says you're a sex addict is really enthusiastic about going to treatment? And oh, by the way, do you think he actually stops watching porn because he went to that treatment? Hell no. So with almost no objective criteria, anyone could be diagnosed as a sex addict, as we've already seen by the test I read a few items from you uh, to earlier. Why is this concept dangerous? Because it's creeping into our judicial system. Judges are referring people to sex addiction treatment centers. Now that's fucked up when you got the judicial system involved in a sham science. Children are being labeled as addicts instead of getting proper treatment. Um, the evidence being those treatment centers in Utah. Parents are being told by clergy and teachers that their child is a sex addict or that porn use will make them an addict. Religious groups are using it in absence only training in our schools. We have people coming into our schools right now and telling children they can't masturbate or they shouldn't masturbate and they're going to hell or other moral judgments on somebody for just being a human being. Chil children even call each other sex addicts. Now, who the hell is doing the diagnosis there? A 10 year old kid, a 15 year old girl, no. That's, that's crazy. And the media of all people are labeling people as sex addicts. And of course, it's very damaging. It damages reputations. It damages lives. There's a lot there. So what does it matter what we call it? According to Dr. Uh, Klein, when homosexuality was called a mental illness, it mattered. When women were called frigid or nymphomaniacs or hysterics, it mattered. When a patient is diagnosed as possessed by the devil instead of a schizophrenic, it clearly matters. 
It determines the treatment to be used and who is qualified to administer the treatment. I hope you can see just by this one statement by my friend, Dr. Klein, that this is, we are treading in dangerous territory when we start using these labels because it does matter. It ha can have lifetime consequences, especially if a fucking judge decides you're a sex addict. So there is a scientific approach to this. And first thing I would do, and what most good psychologists do is examine the underlying beliefs. Look for depression, look for compulsive behavior, look for self-destructive behavior. Any of those things are signs that something else is going on underneath. Try to understand the current circumstances. I'm telling you, a lot of mental illness or temporary depression comes from divorce or from breakups, you know, loss, loss of loved ones and things. Those all can lead to what appears to be sexual or what, what is sexual behavior, but it's not sex addiction. It's a coping mechanism. That's what it is. So understand that early childhood treatment, early childhood training, and early childhood trauma can actually be expressed through sexual behavior in adulthood. So if I'm a psychologist trying to help someone, I'm going to look at these things. Do you see the word sex addiction anywhere in there? No, it's not in there because it doesn't have a diagnosis. I can help somebody. I could diagnose somebody with depression. I can help somebody by diagnosing a trauma. I then have treatment modalities I can then use. So one of the treatment approaches is something we call harm reduction. We, don't, we know people are probably not gonna stop masturbating, but if masturbation is getting in the way of you doing your job, then maybe we can use a harm reduction approach to reduce the interfering behavior so you can continue to function positively. I do know people who say, I can't get my job done because I'm too busy masturbating. Okay, we can deal with that. I am not gonna call you a sex addict. I'm gonna say, you wanna reduce the amount of self-pleasuring you do so you can get your job done and enhance the rest of your life. We may also wanna look at some underlying things. Are you depressed? Is there, do you have some religious shame and guilt? That you haven't dealt with there's there's a lot of things we could work with in that situation and harm reduction is just one area another might be uh, cognitive behavioral therapy ap approaches in fact the combinations oftentimes are very useful and powerful sex therapists do not use the term sex addiction if you find a sex therapist using that term get out of there there is no so the sex addiction term is not even in the website of the American Board of Sexology, period. So if the people most uh, experienced and trained aren't using the term, then maybe the rest of us should stop using it too. So what to do if you encounter a sex addiction counselor? Because they are out there and they're almost always Christians. Here's what I advise. Get the hell out of there. When in doubt, about a treatment approach, ask the therapist, show me the science. If you need help with that, we can help you. You can go to the Secular Therapy Project and you can look at what our criteria for just certifying our psychologists and you'll see some things that might help you query a potential therapist that you wanna work with. But I would always always look at how friendly are they? Are they LGBTQ friendly? So I'm, I'm pretty damn sure if a therapist is well-trained in LGBTQ issues, they are not going to have the notion of sex addiction in their, in their lexicon. Maybe what we're talking about here tonight is a religious addiction. Religious beliefs actually activate reward circuits in the same way as sex and drugs. Have you ever noticed some of these crazy videos you see about people in, in ecstasy in their churches? And I've had many people say I had orgasms during those religious um, those religious um, sessions or services. Well, the same pathways are there. So let's not talk about being a sex addiction. Let's talk a religious addiction. You're, re you're addicted to the shame, guilt, and uh, teachings of, of the religion that taught you all this stuff about your own body. So um, 
a lot of people are claiming or trying to claim that there's neuro, neuropsychiatric, neurological evidence for sex addiction, but there isn't. There are, there's a few very tiny studies that were very poorly done about five or six years ago, and they have not been replicated. And we can't, it, it's just almost impossible to see a difference between somebody who's religiously addicted and somebody who's sexually addicted. <laughs> the, and I'm going to suggest there's probably a religious addiction out there, but I'm not, I don't have a diagnosis for it, so I better shut up. Uh, I'm going to say this, that many people are mislabeling labeling their own sexual behavior. And I'm going to talk briefly before I end up here about relationships. I think people misunderstand their relationships. Let's start with you as a child. And your hormones are starting to go. You're 12, 13 years old. And you start masturbating. So your entire sexual outlet is 100% masturbation. You don't have a sexual partner, so none of your sexual energy is going in that direction. Now, during that time you're being raised as an adolescent, purity culture comes along and says, you are, uh, you're born, uh, you're born bad, you're, you know, you, you were born with original sin and all that sort of stuff. And uh, you are told that you are going to hell for having masturbated or thinking about stuff. And so that kind of programming will reduce your sexual enjoyment. You're gonna still do it, but you put all that shame, that body shame, that anabasturbation, the purity culture shame in there. And now you're masturbating just as much as you were before, and maybe more, and you feel guilty about it. You still aren't expressing yourself with a sex partner. Now let's add a sex partner and your natural energy, you're probably still gonna masturbate somewhat, but you're gonna, redirect much of your sexual energy towards your partner or partners. So anywhere from, you know, some 10% to 100% of your extra energy may be going to your partner. Uh, and you're, you may reduce your masturbatory behavior. That's fine. That's actually pretty damn normal. We're, our energy is always going back and forth. Sometimes we, have, we wanna have more energy for ourselves. Sometimes we wanna have more energy for our partner. That's okay. We're, it's an, it's a, Self-negotiation, if well, you if you will. Um, so that that would be normal without religious shit getting in there. But now purity culture comes in and says, uh, we're going to shame you for your body, your inner masturbation, the purity culture, and we're going to tell you how terrible sex should be and you should save it until you're married. Well, that kind of fucks up your partner's sex. So if you're I I literally a couple of weeks ago, met with a couple who had been married for two years, but they had not had sex for three years. Go figure. They've been married for two years, but they haven't had sex for three years. In other words, they have not had sex since they got married and they didn't have sex a year before they got married. That's, that's fucked up. Now, scratching below the surface, we found a hell of a lot of religious guilt going on there. So partnered sex is so conflicted if you've been told all your life that sex is bad, well, just because you got married doesn't mean that that thought goes away. So now you've got conflicted sex with your partner. It's not enjoyable. What do you do with your sexual energy? You go back to masturbating, but you still have reduced enjoyment with the masturbatory action. That's what I see going on. And I see the damage that purity culture does to relationships in that sense. So there's growing dissatisfaction in your masturbatory behavior there's growing dissatisfaction with your partner you end up not having sex and you're you're experiencing frustration miscommunication anger religious assumptions about what sex should and shouldn't be there's a whole lot of unpacking to go on here if you want to have a satisfying healthy sexual relationship so this isn't addiction this is religious interference let me repeat that. This is not an addiction. This is religious interference. And religious interference can create psychological problems that lead to problematic sexual behavior. I am not under any illusions about that. But the problematic sexual behavior comes from the religious programming. So I'm not a Christian. I don't need to act like one. I want to sum this all up with some things for you can take home. Religion's weak spot is, uh, is sex. That's why every major patriarchal religion is so consumed with what you do with your body. 
I think we should follow the lead of the LGBTQ plus community. They are, they are, they are teaching us. Uh, by us, I mean cis het kind of people like, like I identify. They're teaching us how to be open about our sexuality, and we can learn a lot from their journey and their suffering. Of course, that's happened over, over decades, eons even. But they're showing us the way to open ourselves up. So I'm going to encourage you to be out about your sexuality. I want you to respect and support others in what in your sexuality. It's the biggest challenge you can do to religions. I, I mean, you might say, sure, I fornicate, just like many religious people do. Sure, I masturbate. Don't you? Now, that's the one that'll get most, most people because think about it. If they've never masturbated, they're the odd one out, not you. Sure, I enjoy pornography, just like most religious people. They just can't admit it and they feel guilty about it. <sighs> Frame their behavior. Take the behavior that they're judging and, and reframe it. The main thing religions try to do is control women's bodies. Male sexuality is also sanctioned by religion, but women get the brunt of the shame and the guilt that comes from religions. And we need to challenge this. We can challenge it this way. A, a woman might say, sure, I take birth control because I like sex inside or outside of marriage, just like Donald Trump or Jerry Falwell does. I mean, these are their gods out there, for heaven's sake. Why can't I behave like they do? They get out of jail free when they say I'm a sex addict, or uh, how, I don't know how the hell this guy does it. So I am sex positive, and I'm a secular sexual. I want you to remember that term, secular sexual. I'm not a Catholic sexual. I'm not a Mormon sexual. I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a Muslim sexual i am a secular sexual and when you start framing your sexuality that way it opens up a whole new world to explore who you are what you want to be and take control of your sexuality so in conclusion it's may it's may outdoor fucking starts today and of course may 7th just the other day was naked gardening day so these are important Important things to remember, as I said right off the beginning, uh, May is also Masturbation Month, so we have a lot to do this month. So, folks, get busy. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ray. <laughs> that was fantastic. We really, really appreciate that. Um, we have got a dearth of of questions i mean there is it's a long list and it's pretty thick too uh you want to start off with one kara yeah definitely um yeah we have a whole lot um some of them all kind of cluster around the same sort of question so i'll just start with that um several people asked uh something along the lines of do you think that porn is harmful if it's being overused and um is it possible to be addicted to watching porn or something like that in the same way that someone might be addicted to some other behavior like playing video games that might cause them to not get you know their work done that they need to be doing and how do you identify if that's happening i get that i get that question a lot i don't hear people talking about facebook addiction or Twitter addiction, or YouTube addiction. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we determine what is too much? Mm -hmm. I, I know people who literally can't have a human interaction without looking at their damn phone. <laughs> so I'm thinking they're an addict. Uh, they're not looking at porn. They're not, they're just looking at their phone while I'm, while I'm trying to have a conversation with them. So, okay, that's answer number one. Answer number two is, Lots of things can cause us problems in our life, but who's determining the problem? It, I need to decide, okay, I'm watching too much YouTube tonight and I, I got work to do. So I have to, I have to create the balance there. Am I a YouTube um, addict? I mean, they're not, nobody's going to say I'm a YouTube addict and yet it's interfering with me getting my work done. So that's the attitude I take. Now, it seems, though, every time you add sex to something, it, it, or it adds this whole moral layer to what's going on. And my suggestion is the moral layer actually makes you do more of what you don't want to do. 
So if you're sitting there thinking, dang, I got to get to work and quit jacking off here. Uh, then you feel guilty about doing all this. Then you're probably going to jack off some more because you're trying to stop being guilty. I mean, it's, it becomes a vicious cycle. Now, I'm not here to diagnose anybody. I'm certainly not here to treat anybody. But if you feel your behavior, whether it's Facebook addiction or porn addiction, which, of course, you know, I don't believe in either one. If you think you're having trouble, then go seek out some help. Just go talk to a therapist. Most therapists have got some good, simple techniques they can teach you. What, what's causing the problem, I mean, if, if you, have to, you have to kind of make your own determination. If your wife says you were looking at porn too much, that bears, I mean, they may be right. I'm not, I mean, they may be right in their perspective, in their worldview. But it's you that has to make that determination, that decision. If, if, for example, I know a lot of spouses think their their spouse should not look at porn at all. Well, that ain't going to happen for most people. So, and b- by the way, my spouse is not my parent. They're not my dictator. They don't tell me what I can and can't do with my body and my mind. And that's hard for some couples to figure out. We are not in a parent-child relationship here. We are in an adult-to-adult relationship. I decide what I do with my mind and my body. If you don't like what I do with my mind and my body, we need to negotiate. We need to talk about it. Or maybe we need to get fucking divorced so we can go find somebody who won't try to tell us what to do with our bodies and minds. But a lot of the times the spouse is coming from a point of moral authority or religious condemnation. (sighs) That has no place in it. That's a parent. That's a patriarchal approach, and I use the word patriarchal, but it could be coming, and oftentimes is coming from the female side of the relationship. Um. Anyway, so I, the 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 easy answer there is no easy answer. The answer is if something's causing that much trouble and you're not getting your work done, then go do something about it. It really doesn't matter whether it's sex, porn addiction, por- pornography, or YouTube. Okay. So usually it sounds like uh, kind of the problem is when people are saying sex addiction, what they're actually doing is making a moral judgment, not actually a diagnosis. And that's what we're trying to avoid. You just put it better than I did. Thank you, Kara. I, knew I was I taking liked. notes. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So yeah, that that clears that up. So I've got another one here um, that someone was asking. Um, do you ever receive pushback on your stance on this issue with people saying something like, oh, well, you're an atheist, so you just want to be free to sin some more or something like that? And how do you respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I don't believe in the concept of sin. I mean, that's a theological concept. Um, so number one, uh, it's not because I want to go out and sin. I, I I have as much sex as I want to have. I have never raped anybody. I, I don't abuse anybody sexually. Um, um, so I, I don't have a real problem. It's not my problem. It's your problem. <laughs> if, you, if you think that I want to sin, then that's your worldview. It's not mine. You see, I'm not going to, I do. Here, here's what I think I'm trying to say and not saying it very well. I don't want to, I don't want to adopt your worldview to explain my behavior. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, you're, I like you're, that. You have a theological worldview that's, that talks about sin. I don't even fucking believe in sin. I don't believe in your damn God. Why would I want to explain it in your terms? That, that it's a non-starter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really, I think that was a great question. And I, I hope you take whoever answered that question. I hope you take that back. Don't buy into their frame. And many of us were raised in a religious environment. So we, we get sucked in very easily. But if that mm-hmm. person, if, if Kara, if you ask me that right now, I would say, well, number one, I don't believe in sin. And number two, I'm not in your worldview. So it me- it's meaningless to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Of course, right. they, won't, they won't like that answer because they want you to answer it with a Christian perspective. <laughs> yeah, it's the only valid perspective. You, you have to agree to my worldview. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's no other choices. <laughs> Dr. Ray, we have another um, uh, question here. Uh, I was taught that 
masturbation was the same as getting an abortion, a lady getting an abortion. So I'd imagine this is coming from a man. Uh, what do you respond to it? How, how do you respond to this? I would go uh, suggest that you go watch the very profound movie called The Life of Brian. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and recognize that every sperm is sacred. <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about, Eric. <laughs> uh, you were what you were taught was within that within that Christian framework. There is no biology in the Bible, and what bio? In fact, I wrote a whole chapter in my book, Sex and God, about the biology in the Bible, and there fucking isn't any. That chapter is the shortest chapter in the whole book. It's two pages long. Of course, the next chapter is all about the biology. But So what you're telling me is you were taught a version of biology that's based on magical thinking and that, and, and you've absorbed it. Now it has emotional content and emotional value to you. So you're probably going to need to go in and do some strong, deep evaluation of that and practice some new behaviors that may need some professional help. I also would suggest before you do the professional help that you do a few practice sessions. I will suggest this practice session for you. And that is see if you can just lay down and look at porn or fantasize however you masturbate and concentrate on enjoying your body. And as you're concentrating on enjoying your body, Notice that um, thoughts come in. This is bad. God says I shouldn't do this. Uh, I'm doing an abortion with my, <laughs> with my sperm. You know, just listen to those things come in. And as they come in, just let them float away as you go back to feeling the sensations. This, it will take you many times. I'm not saying how many, but you could try this a few times and see if it helps you make progress to more enjoy your body because as I said earlier, you're the first sex partner you'll ever have and you may be the last one you'll ever have. So take it seriously. This is the only body you get. Enjoy your fucking body and getting rid of some of those old thoughts, reprogramming some of those old thoughts might take some time and might take some practice. Um, but you aren't aborting anything. Every, and I, I am serious. Go watch Life of Brian. It may give you some laughs, and it might also help you get over this notion you were talked about uh, as well. Are you uh, meaning the, the the meaning of life? Uh, the, every sperm is sacred. Is yeah. I'm sorry. The meaning. Yeah. The meaning of life. <laughs> life of Brian I'm, is yeah. still good, but <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sorry. My my mistake. Yeah, I get the two mixed up. Uh, every sperm is sacred. Yeah, the meaning of life is yeah, it's in it. Yeah. And there's a, uh, a version of the Duggars in the, <laughs> in the meaning of life, too. <laughs> there's like 4,000 kids piling oh, yeah. out of this tiny house. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I've got another one. Uh, someone else was asking about um, asexual people and kind of wondering a couple of things. Um First of all, um, is that considered by Christians, if you're asexual, is that considered like more godly or is it considered problematic? And then is there, is it abnormal? Is it something that needs to be fixed? Like, where does that fall into all of this? Well, biologically speaking, with respect to humans, somewhere around one to 2% of all humans are asexual in, in various ways. There's many different approaches or a aspects to asexuality. So it's perfectly normal. Um, it's, it's not real common, but there's a lot of things that aren't real common. They're still perfectly normal. So don't let that worry you. Uh, yeah. Christians don't know what to do with a, with asexuality <laughs> because you know, your job, your job is to get out there and have babies and uh, propagate the religion because the real reason religions want you to have lots of babies is so you'll infect them with your, with your religion. That's what I say in my book, the God virus is, the most effective way of infecting somebody with religion is through childbirth. <laughs> because <laughs> most everybody adopts the religion of their birth or a religion very close to their birth. I mean, I might have been born a Baptist and become a Pentecostal, but those are pretty close. Very rarely do you get a Baptist, born Baptist, becoming a Hindu. That just almost never happens. So the, it's, you're almost always in the 
in the framework of whatever you were born in, certainly within the culture you were born in. So I just forgot the question. <laughs> Um, the other part they were asking was, um, how, how do Christians sort of perceive of, of asexual people? Is it, is it right. like they're being more godly or they need to be yeah. fixed? Well, here's the deal. I think the, I think the Catholics accidentally hit upon this, um, about 2000 years, oh, no, about 1800 years ago, maybe not 2000, but, uh, because what they've done is they've elevated asexuality to a holy, uh, rank. I mean, that's why celibacy among priests and nuns, they're basically saying be asexual. Uh, or if you're going to be sexual, you're married to, uh, you know, you're married to Jesus. If you're a nun, you're having sex with Jesus, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <Ew. laughs> Inky. I don't like so, it. Way more holes than I do. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, so the, the cat here's i think and I, I, I let's say you were raised in a catholic environment and you are asexual and you're a boy especially if you're um, a second child or something like that in many catholic traditions there's a lot of pride in the family for one of their sons becoming a priest well if you are not sexually motivated if you're not wanting to get married have children uh, or follow the party line and you and you are asexual you could fit into that priest role real well and that would give you high status it would bring great recognition to your family it would also bring power in some if you become a bishop or something so there's a lot of benefits that come if your body is not telling you to constantly get out and have sex and that's that's the that would be the benefit but the problem is and i and i think there is a significant number of catholic priests that are probably asexual and they didn't have to struggle with it. it they just never had the drive to begin with so not a hard thing for them to wear that collar and be celibate because that's just the way that just nat comes natural for them however there's also a significant number of priests that are not asexual and that's where the problem is because now you're asking 70 percent uh, maybe 30 percent are asexual I mean, you take that 1% of the population, you died in half because the other half is female. So you got half a percent of the population and many, many of those raised in Catholics then become priests. Well, let's say 30% of all the priests are actually asexual. That's, that's pretty holy. That's pretty high ranking. <laughs> the other 70% though are struggling. They're masturbating every morning. They're, they're abusing children, you know, doing all the crazy stuff we've seen in the Catholic church. Pope, Pope Francis may be asexual, which means he's never had to struggle with this issue. And when I say struggle, I mean, really, uh, the cognitive distance between your natural biological drives and what the Catholic Church tells you. That's what I mean by struggle. It's a stupid struggle. It's an unnecessary struggle. It's a struggle that leads to suicide in some people. It leads to self-abuse in some people. It leads to mental illness in some people because they're trying to do something their body absolutely is not made to do. So in some ways, the asexual person has a real inside track in the Catholic side. However, on the Protestant side and in other places, uh, it's, it's frowned upon because you should be out there having babies and you're suspect if you're not having babies. You're suspect in the sense that, oh, you may be gay. Now that's a big problem or you're suspect that you're asexual. They don't even know what an asexual is in the Protestant church. It just makes no sense to them. It doesn't make much sense in the Catholic church. We gotta remember a lot of what we're talking about here is basic biology that the church has no framework for. No, there's no biology in the Bible. Oh no, it, it is. Men and women have a different number of ribs and somebody got <laughs> made out of dirt. I mean, it's science y'all. <laughs> and bats are birds it just makes total sense yeah come on Earth yeah. is a circle all right, all right. <laughs> undeniable <laughs> we got one final question um for you dr a before we um uh, move on to the uh conclusion <laughs> so um the the question here is a little kludgy but i'll just kind of paint the picture uh, let's say uh, i have a husband and that uh the husband's had multiple affairs tells me that he feels guilty and he feels, but still gets an emotional rush from having these affairs. Um, 
uh, but they, but my husband says that he can't stop. Uh, what, what treatment is there? What recommendations do you have? Um, how, how, how could I navigate through this relationship? I'm not sure I could do much for you. That's a pretty big question you're asking. Yeah. I'll, I'll say this. Um, there's several different angles to come at. Um, first of all, the, the relationship that you're describing, it sounds to me like there's an assumption of exclusivity for life. So if two people decide they're going to be sexually exclusive to each other for the rest of their lives, that's a very big promise to make at any age, but especially at a young age, teenage, 20s, whatever. So if you're going to say, you know, I haven't had much experience yet with sex, but I'm going to commit to you for the rest of my life. It's kind of like saying, you know, I haven't had much experience with food, but I sure like steak. So I think I'll just have steak for the rest of my life. That's kind of what you're saying. Now, if you want to commit to being exclusive, you notice I do not use the word monogamous because there are almost no people on this planet that are monogamous. Most of us have had at least two sex partners, which means we're not monogamous by definition. Remember, Jesus said one sex partner for life. That's the Christian definition of monogamy. It's also the biological definition. But the fact is, you're you're asking something that's fairly unnatural for human beings. And we do know that a large number of people have affairs throughout a, a marriage. If you're married for 25 years, somebody's probably going to have an affair sooner or later. There's a lot of statistics to back that up. So, so first of all, marriage in the way we construct it in the West is fairly unnatural. Now that we know more about biology, we know that both men and women are pretty darn promiscuous. And I don't mean promiscuous in a negative way. We like sex. And we also know that biologically or neurologically, our brains go through, <clears throat> I'm speaking to the person and others that might have the same issue. We, we like to get our fix. <laughs> we like the excitement and we crave the excitement. Some people... I mean, I know I have friends that go out there and climb, climb straight up cliffs, and I think they're nuts. But I go out and climb mountains every year. I don't, and so other people think I'm nuts. Why do I do that? Because I get a high from it. I really enjoy it. It gives me a, a dopamine fix or something. Well, sex can be the same way. Sex gives you this sense of adventure, whatever. Whether you're male or female, lots of people like that fix. So you may be married to somebody who just loves doing that, and it's very compelling. Now, my question to that person is, do they see it as a problem? If they're feeling guilty about it, and they're ashamed, and they're hurting you, and they don't like hurting you, those are all issues that should be brought up in a therapeutic environment. Go to a therapist who knows what they're doing, and, and they can maybe help. But be prepared for this. Be prepared for that person, your husband in this case, or whoever's your partner, to say, you know, I just like lots of different people and lots of different sex. And the fact is, there's nothing morally wrong with that. It's a violation of your agreement. So you may need to renegotiate your agreement, or you may need to not be in a relationship anymore. I, I don't have an answer for you. But keep in mind, every human being is in charge of their own body and their own mind. And if he doesn't see it as a real problem, or if he's not willing to, quote, fix the problem, I'm not even sure it's a problem. I'm not, I don't want to put that frame on it. If you think it's a problem, and he feels like it's a problem because he wants to stay married to you, then you got to go, you got to go to a therapist and figure out how to negotiate this. Uh. That's probably the best I could say. I don't know who this person is that asked the question. I don't know any more than what you told me. So I'm going out on a big limb and I don't like doing, I don't like doing therapy proxy, proxy therapy here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Ray. I, get, get rid of all the moral overlay. Just get rid of that and see what happens. Sometimes you get rid of the moral shit, the, the guilt, the shame, the sinning, and the behavior changes. I know I, I want to keep talking about this. One more thing, Eric. I know so many people who had so many problems with sex when they were religious and when they stepped out of religion, they got rid of their religion 
their quote, sex problems went away. I know a lot of people who tell me that. So what's going on there? It's this guilt and shame that's driving the, driving the behavior. Get away from the guilt and shame and sometimes the behavior changes. We've that's had not, several that's R- not, yeah, go ahead. We've had several RFRX shows where we've talked about like having a contract and uh, um, both like in the nudism talk and there's a few others that I can't really remember, but it sounds like you're almost saying, hey, hey, the two of you sit down, take a look at this contract. Does it need to be renegotiated? Does it need to be um, uh, solidified some or shored up some? Right. Uh, and if you can't do that with the two of you, maybe find a professional who can help uh, do that. But just be honest with one another. It's really hard, especially when your marriage started with the Christian assumptions of uh, yeah. exclusivity. Renegotiating relationships is a skill and it's a skill you have to learn. And both sides have to be willing to learn it. You can't just say, well, you're the morally wrong person, so you have to learn it. No, that doesn't work that way. Well, Dr. Ray, again, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about this. I I got a lot out of it and I really, really appreciate it. This, is, this has been something I wanted to have uh, on the books for a while and I'm glad we're finally getting to it. Before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or conclusions or things that, I mean, you've talked quite a bit, so I can imagine... <laughs> You got, you're short on words. <laughs> oh, I'm never. Have you ever known me to be short on words? <laughs> you usually have to tell me to shut up. I, I don't, Eric. I will just say, go look at my books. Uh, Sex and God, especially. I really address a lot of this stuff. Go look at David Lay's book, The Mythos of Sex Addiction, or uh, Marty Klein's book on the um, America's War on Sex. Any of those books will help you understand why this culture is behaving the way it is and how it's affecting you personally. I think that's an important to understand. Fantastic. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up the discussion part and the Q&A part of our show, but we've got a little bit more coming. Um, Kara, would you like to take it from here? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this was fantastic as we knew it would be. And if you're ready for more, come back next week, same time, same place. And we'll be hearing from Nancy Pinto about cancer while Christian, just follow the damn rules. And uh, for this RFRX, Nancy will be joining us to share how her lifelong faith fell apart after the way religious people behaved when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She'll cover her religious upbringing, some key events that happened after her diagnosis, as well as words of encouragement and advice for those facing similar circumstances. So really important topic that I definitely want to hear about as well. And um, if you still want even more after that, all of our previous RFRX recordings can be found on our YouTube channel that Eric is dropping in the chat now. Um, Questions, comments, death threats, go to our email address, (laughs) which Eric is also putting in the chat. Um, And don't forget about our blog and our podcast. And you can also follow Follow us on social media. Oops, that was my alarm, sorry. And um, all of the links to that are going in the chat as well. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. We are now on TikTok. I don't know how to use that one, but someone here does. (laughs) And so whichever of those you like to use, feel free to like, follow, subscribe, retweet, you know, whatever. Um, It really helps us out, you know, to get out there and and get seen. So, you know, more people can find out about us and join. And you can also engage with what's going on and find out about what we're doing all over here. And speaking of which, Eric, do you want to mention the newsletter? Yes, I do, folks. We have a newsletter that comes out every someday. And uh, in this newsletter, we've got uh, some news about upcoming events or things that are happening, like where you can find us maybe at a convention. But more specifically, we've got the fall excursion that's coming up as well. Um, The newsletter also has recent resources that might have been added to the website, uh, some published videos that might have been put up on YouTube, uh, and even some blog posts. So uh, I dropped a link into the chat. You'll find all these links also in the YouTube description if you're interested in any of that. Okay, so um, before we wrap up and we hear from our fabulous Helen Green, I would like to hear from you. Folks, uh, tell me what you thought about this program. We've got a little feedback poll here. And while that feedback poll is running, if we could please bring on our fantastic ambassador and support group leader, Helen Green. Helen, what are your thoughts about this evening? 
This was a really, really great talk. Um, not only on sex addiction, but thinking about addiction differently as well. I thought that was a really good takeaway that Dr. Ray um, brought up. You know, I love listening to you, Dr. Ray. You always give like really good information and you're pleasant and wonderful and you're just great. So um, I really got a lot out of this talk. I It made me think about things a little bit differently, which I always really appreciate. And again, like I'm to our audience, like if you are, in, if you like this talk, please go on our YouTube channel. Look at all the other talks we have available. Like come join us every Monday. We are so much fun. Like look at all like the fun people you got to talk to. We're wonderful people. You get to hang out with us. I would want to hang out with us. I would want to hang out with me. We're so much fun. <laughs> so please come join us. Also, too, if you are getting something out of this and you want to do more, please consider becoming a volunteer with Recovering from Religion. Fill out an application and join us and be a part of this wonderful community. And thank you again. I'm very grateful to be part of this organization and to all my wonderful friends and fellow volunteers all the love. And again, thank you, Dr. Ray. This was wonderful. I learned a lot. And again, I, I, I reiterate, but it does help you think about things a little bit differently, give you a good perspective. And that's what I've always gotten out of these talks. So again, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you back here next week. Same bat, bat channel, same bat time. I totally screwed that up, but that's okay. <laughs>